I invite you now to turn in your uh, Bibles to uh, Titus chapter 1. If you're using the Bibles that are in your seats, that's found on page 844. I'll give you a moment to, to find that. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, and we'll uh, uh, hit different verses throughout this uh, short letter of the Apostle Paul to his uh, traveling companion and co-worker in the gospel, uh, Titus. Uh, Paul is on the very west coast of, of uh, Turkey, uh, writing this letter back to Titus, who was on the island of, of Crete, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, kind of south of Italy. And uh, Paul had left Titus there on the island to finish the work as Paul went on traveling further to eventually get back up to, back up to Rome. Titus 1.1, 1, 1. this is God's word eternally true. Paul, a servant of God and an, apostle, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, of faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now skip down to verse 9. Same chapter, still chapter 1, verse 9. Speaking of elders, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in the faith, and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, Nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now go down to verse 12 of chapter 2. So chapter 2 and, and verse 12. Speaking of the gospel. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now down to verse 15, same chapter, chapter 2, verse 15. These then are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. Now down to verse 8. Verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. 
You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. Here ends our reading uh, this morning. This is uh, God's word, eternally true. You have a response of thankfulness uh, printed for you in your bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Um, we know this especially on January 1st. What do people do on January 1st besides recover if they've been naughty on December 31st? They make what? New Year's yeah, resolutions. New Year's resolutions are what caused the gym to get flooded for the first two and a half weeks of January. And the regulars all go, oh got to wait to get on this machine. Uh, but, but New Year's resolutions are, are related to our goals and things people really wish, you know what, this isn't true of my life, but it really should be. And so I resolve and, and, and they hope, and sometimes those work, most of the times they don't, but, but I resolve to be this way or I have this goal and so I'm not going to do this. Uh, and, and so there are different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trajectories we can set ourselves on. And things that are barriers to those trajectories. And, um, I, you know, I remember my um, one of my favorite uncles. I have, I have a number of favorite uncles. I liked my uncles growing up, and still do. Uh, but uh, I remember they came to our house in, in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, New York, and stayed. And, and he had just gotten out of the army. This is my uncle who drove trucks in Germany, like you, Bob, just probably about three years before you. And um, and when he got out of the army. He traded the crew cut for a hippie hair. And he, it was cool hippie hair, too. And he always had this crazy beard, you know. And he's still today. He'll have a crazy mustache or a crazy beard, that kind of thing. He just has fun with it. And, and uh, Richard, everybody loves Richard. Uh, but uh, other fun uncles, too, that, I, that I've had. But I, I remember when uh, they stayed with us, and Richard was just out of the Army, so I came up with my dad, my grandfather, uh, his dad. Uh, and, and my aunt, uh, and, and they stayed with us. And I remember Richard would stay in bed and sleep till like 11:30 in the morning. And I'd been I'd been a guy who you know woke up early and and uh, and but I thought this was cool. So I don't know metabolism changes and you get in your teenage years. And so I became a person who slept late, and, and I've always been that kind of person since that since that time. And, but uh, uh, when I got my heart fixed or, or started to get my, my heart fixed back in 2004, I thought, wonder if I can run again. And so I started running and that just became a thing. You know, I thought at the time uh, uh, W was president and he was famous in the early days. You know, they talk about president's lifestyles in the early days of every president, that he would go out on a run. Uh, and so I thought, wow, he treats that like brushing his teeth. And so I thought, Okay, I'll I'll start running, and, and but but uh, at the time I was thirty pounds heavier than I am today, and and uh, you know a lot of times people start running because they want to lose weight or different things um, uh, are part of that are, are part of that goal. For me, even now, uh, part of uh, staying on that that goal of being yeah, I remember getting out of the the golf cart and having to run thirty yards to get to my ball and getting tired. You know, I'm thinking, oh man, I shouldn't do it. But but part of the part of that goal is is uh, and one of my weaknesses or barrier to that goal is donuts. <laughs> I love donuts, and, and for those of you who have been through the officers training, uh, whether you're an officer or not, you know, it's, when we do that, that's you know, it's open invitation um, to, to folks to come and, and, and learn. Uh, but you know, we get donuts, and we have donuts and coffee, and I just, I love, one of the reasons I love doing officer's training is because I get donuts and coffee every Saturday morning. <laughs> really, really it is. And, and um, when I, you know, Dunkin' Donuts is, and I like Krispy Kreme too, so don't get mad at me if you're a Krispy Kreme person. <laughs> but, you know, Dunkin' Donuts is on my way home from Walmart. And so literally every time I make the left turn off of 70 to get onto Shotwell Road, I'm thinking, should I get a donut? <laughs> or should I get a dozen donuts? <laughs> and and our, our, our session uh, used to meet, um, we're not because of COVID now, we used to meet up at uh, McDonald's and Chick-fil-A up on Nightdale Boulevard. A and so there's Krispy Kreme, <laughs> literally on my way home. And uh, when my kids were still at home, they're not anymore. <laughs> That's hard. Um, but, but uh, you know, I would think, oh, I'll get 
you know, Krispy Kreme for everybody. And then when they wake up, our session meets at 7 in the morning on Saturdays. And so I get home, my family's still asleep. And, um, and I think I'll get Krispy Kremes. And that was a good excuse for me to eat Krispy Kremes. Uh, but uh, uh, my, my goal of, of staying at a good weight uh, has an enemy, uh, and that's donuts. Uh, maybe for you it's different things uh, there. But last week we talked about our goal as humans. And this is a goal that's there for even non-Christians. Because non-Christians also were created by God, and God determines what a human being is to be. And, and that's to be an image of him. Now, that doesn't mean that any human being can create matter out of nothing or that we can cause the tides to change or that we can uh, make mountains out of flat ground or valleys out of mountains. Uh, but it does mean we can be like God in our character. And that's what being part of the image of God is like. We can be like God in certain ways in our character. So that's our goal as human beings, but we're told as, as Christians especially, beyond being part of the, uh, being an image of God or being a reflection of God, that we specifically are images of Christ, who is God. And that we've been given this lived out example in Jesus' incarnation, from the time he was a boy to the time he was saying his last words before he was ascended on high 40 days after his crucifixion. We have this example of how you live and interact with people that shows us what being Christ-like is like. Uh, and, and so we can follow that. So that's our goal as, as, as Christians. And you have a, um, a blank there in our introduction, two things. Our goal as human beings and as Christians is godliness. Or you can put Christ-likeness. Uh, that's the goal of an, a, a Christian. Um, Christ-likeness, godliness. And we see this is a term that's very uh, a part of Paul's letter to Titus and his concern for the new Christians on the island of Crete. It's interesting, I've recently been, I'm still kind of in the book of Acts right now because we've divided it up in our, our readings if you follow along in our, 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 our reading chart. But uh, uh, Paul, when he was being taken to Rome to, to be imprisoned and be in trial there, he actually sailed by Crete. But it doesn't look like they ever actually landed. And this is part of where the winds get them and they get tossed off into the middle of the sea. They eventually wind up shipwrecked at Malta, which is a different island um, uh, west of, uh, of Crete. But, you know, Paul's sitting there, and, and, and probably in his mind after he was released from his Roman imprisonment at the end of Acts 28, um, Luke tells us he was there for two years, so we know he got out. Um, he may have gone to Spain. He said that was his intention. And probably as he's coming down from Spain, he stops at Crete. It's all that big island. Crete's a big island. And, and he stops there and he establishes with Titus and Timothy establishes churches there. Leaves Titus behind. And, and, but he knows what Cretans are famous for. We see it in there in verse 12. And, you know, some, of their own, uh, 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 some of their own poets have said, um, one of their own prophets has said, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Woo! <laughs> right? They were they're all Homer Simpson. And so he's concerned. He's, he, Paul's thinking, how does this affect a person particularly if they're a Christian? What things are we to be about as Christians, Christ-like ways, that will be affected if we're naturally, or if the cultural thing that we're accepted for is being a liar? Being lazy, if that's approved of and laughed at, and there's never any condemnation for lying or for being lazy or, or for being brutish um, <laughs> there uh, or, or a glutton. And, and so, so Paul thinks through this, and so he writes to Titus with particular concerns of, of threats to godliness. Threats that were particular to, to Cretans, but also to us, too, because we know these things are part of us. We're, we're tempted to lie. You know, I'm, I'm tempted to and fall to you know, eating too much. It's one of the reasons I run, so I can eat more, um, <laughs> because I love to eat. Uh, but but these, these things that are apart from godliness, um, we have barriers to these things. Um, donuts, so to speak. 
Uh, and, and so be there in your outline in the introduction in the church, in the church, and for you as a Christian, there are blockades to our goal. In the church, there are blockades to our goal. And, and this morning, the blockade that we'll talk about that Paul addresses here among some different blockades uh, to our goal of godliness is wolves. Wolves uh, that are in the church. Um, and, and this is, uh, Paul never uses the term wolves in Titus. But he had used it in Acts 20 to describe the same kind of person. Uh, when, and Bob read that for us. And he's talking to the Ephesian elders um, years, years before, in about 50, AD 59. So um, five years before he had been with the Ephesian elders. And, and he said, you know, I know in the past I was with you three years, but here's what I fear. I know that wolves will arise from among your own people in the church. And they'll not spare the flock. And Paul's deeply concerned about this. But Paul didn't invent this idea. Uh, we see it early on from the leadership of God's people um, in the Old Testament. Moses had wolves rise up from among the Israelites, uh, right, and, and, and come up against him. David did. We've just been in First and Second Samuel. You know, David's own sons were wolves among the people of God. They rose up. And they caused trouble. They caused rebellion. They caused discord and chaos. They caused God's people not to be under for a time. Him, David. And God promised, I will bring my blessing to my people through David and through his descendants. Um, Jeroboam comes up and starts, starts northern Israel. Takes ten tribes with him when David's grandson, Rehoboam, takes the throne. And, and so wolves is not a new idea, and Jesus refers to it in, in the Sermon on the Mount. We saw there in Matthew 7 that Bob read for us, that, that Jesus talks about wolves. He talks about what they're like. And he says, these wolves aren't people like that are screaming about ungodly things that are outside the church uh, that you see on the news. He says, these, these, here's what wolves are like, Jesus says. They're wearing... Sheep's clothing. So what's he mean? They look like Christians on the outside. So that means they're in the church. They're doing church things. They're probably very devoted to the church. Jesus specifically there is talking in, in the hearing of the Pharisees, and he's talking about them. Because the Pharisees were part of God's people, and they were wolves. They were dividing God's people. Right, Even at Jesus uh, uh, standing before Pilate and the people in Jerusalem uh, uh, on the day of his death. And they're, they're working against God's purposes, causing chaos, convincing people not to follow the son of David, but to follow them instead. And Jesus describes them further and, and into, past the Pharisees and into the early church and into our day. He says, these people will, at final judgment, they, they'll think they're okay. Because they were in the church all their lives. And they'll get a final judgment and say, Lord, Lord. And they'll be surprised that they're being excluded. And that Jesus is saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoer. But during their lives, what's he say in Matthew 7? They're pro they say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name. In, in our, since we're not in a charismatic church, we say, didn't I teach Sunday school in your name? And I think all our Sunday school teachers, well, almost all of them, uh, all of you who are here are believers. Uh, but, but, you know, and, and so these people are, have been in the church and in church ministries, in church ministries in Jesus' name, and they get to final judgment, and Jesus says, no, you're a wolf. Drop back five verses or four verses. It's all there in Matthew 7. Wolves in sheep's clothing. People who are known by their fruit, not by what they say they are, not by who they're pretending to be. 
You know, I've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, junipers that go down. I have a steep front hill, and so we have junipers planted there. And, and uh, you know, if one of the junipers could speak and said, I'm an oak tree, doesn't matter. A tree or a plant is known by its fruit. If one of the junipers said, I'm an apple tree, it's like, okay. If I say I'm Napoleon, don't believe me. Okay, I don't live in France, and I'm not leading the French in 1802, or he may have been exiled there, 1800. Um, and, and so there are, uh, in the church, blockades to our goal, and they're wolves. The wolves Paul described in Acts chapter 20 to the Ephesian elders, and now he describes in just, in, in, in regard to who they are, what they do, what their effect is, and how you can how you can recognize them. So that's our number one point. First of all, what are wolves? What are wolves? There are 37 descriptors of wolves in Titus. 37. So I picked out every little fact in there. And you could say more because I skipped over all the things he says in, in, in chapter 2 when he's saying instruct the, the older women to be like this and the younger men and the servants to be like this and all the older men, you know, those things, when he gives characteristics of what you should be like, if you look, look at in verse 3, 3, chapter 3, verse 3, what's he say there? He says, and it, it's in your, um, it, it's also printed, I mean, you're there, it's also printed in our declaration of the gospel. He says in 3, 3, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient. And then he goes into these adjectives that he's described the wolves by. And he says, we were that way too. And so there's a sense in which, as Paul's writing this letter to Titus, that every positive characteristic he tells Christians to be like are the opposite of what the wolves are in the church. So when he says, you'll be self-controlled, and we'll talk about that maybe next week, and that's a big emphasis in, in Titus. Be self-controlled. Why is that? Because Cretans are, and these wolves, who are unregenerate cre Cretans, are lazy. They don't have self-control. They're gluttons. They don't have self-control. So, but, but apart from that, you know, apart from those things, just looking at the wolves in the church, 37 descriptions. 37 adjectives used to describe the wolves in the church. So this is huge for Titus, uh, the book, Titus. It's a huge emphasis that Paul has as we look at this. So the question is, who are they? Who are wolves? And we've talked about that a little bit, but to, to map it out for you in terms of what Paul actually says here in Titus, who are wolves? What, who are they? One. Okay, so A1. They're in the church. They're in the church. If, if someone who's attacking the church is not in the church, they're not called a wolf. Okay. A wolf, biblically, is a category for somebody who's in the church, attacking the church from within. Okay. And we'll, we'll look at a, a diagram about that in, in a little bit. My wife hates when I say that because she wants to see it now. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> they're in the church, but aren't, guess what? Believers. They're in the church, but they aren't believers. Look at verse 4. Um, again, positive to negative. What does Paul call Titus as a church leader in Crete for the time being? He says, my true son in the faith. It, it, it's the backside of that coin is the wolves are not true sons of God. They're not children of God. But, but further, to make, that, to make that more clear, look at, verse, look at ver verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, it talks about to the pure, that is you guys, believers, Titus, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and those who do not believe. That's who I how he identifies his wolves. They don't believe. They're in the church. They're acting religious. They're teaching, we'll talk about that. They're teaching stuff. They're presuming to be leaders, but they do not, they do not believe. Um, 
And so these are not believers. Chapter 1, verse 15. They're in the church, but not believers. Number two, but they falsely, that's your blank, but they falsely think they are believers, but they are not. Look at chapter 1, verse 16. So he just said they don't believe. And then in verse 16, the next verse, he says, they claim to know God. They're in the church. They claim to know God. They'd be offended if you said, I don't think you're a believer. They'd say, what? And they'd start naming the stuff. You know, like a session we were looking at, uh, Second, uh, Second Corinthians 11, and, and these, these unbelieving leaders in the Corinthian church were naming all this worldly stuff that was part of their resume. You know, they'd be greatly offended if you said, you know, you're not a believer, but Paul clearly identifies them as not being believers there in Corinth. But Paul does this with these wolves in the church here. And so, verse 16, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. A tree is known by its fruit. That's what Jesus said, and that's Paul's just putting that in different words here. Their action, look at their actions, Titus. They deny at every point where what they want to do and what God wants to do are in disparity with one another, if that's a word, uh, that, that, uh, that they do what they want to do. By their actions, they deny him. They say, nope, he's not our Lord. Now, they're not saying that out loud, but that's what's going on in their souls. By their actions, they're denying Jesus. They're denying walking in his ways. So they falsely think they're believers, but they're not. And then number three, they can be two, two realms for us in 2020. Oh, boy, I sound like Barbara Walters there. Is that right, Barbara Walters? Yeah, 2020. Um, they can be in our church or uh, on TV, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so they can be writing Christian books that are in the Christian bookstore or Christian books that are in Walmart. I'm glad Walmart carries, I mean, they carry Bibles and Christian books in there. That's great. Um, but... Um, they can be, you know, on the bookshelves in Walmart or the Christian bookstore, or you can order their, them as an, under Christian category on Amazon. Um, they can be on Christian TV. They can be on secular TV on Sunday mornings when they're running, you know, different worship services, that kind of thing. Uh, when I was, uh, uh, Betsy and I were uh, on a, a, a cruise uh, 11 years ago for our 20th anniversary, um, uh, we were on, on, on Sunday and they had for their um, worship service, you could go watch the, the broadcast of Joel Osteen. <laughs> I, I, I read my Bible at my breakfast table looking out at the ocean instead. Uh, but, but they can be on the radio. So, so, but they're in the church. They can be in a local church or in Christendom within the church um, in, a more broad, in a more broad sense. Uh, they can be producing Christian podcasts just because it says christian on it or just because it says church does not mean it's coming from a believer jesus said check the fruit check the actions by their actions are they denying him if they are denying him by their actions it means they do not believe some of you have watched that netflix special some of you, a couple of you watched it and you commended it to me. I watched it, mentioned it, and a bunch of you have watched it since. It's called American Gospel. And, and it's written by a believer, someone actually maybe in our denomination uh, produced and wrote that and interviewed those folks. And those folks are all kind of folks in our circles who are speaking of this. But, um, yeah, one of the, one of the people in, in that that speaks is, uh, I think, the nephew of Benny Hinn. Some of you know who Benny Hinn is. Benny Hinn was down in Orlando. He was literally like a mile and a half away from our seminary campus. Um, I never went to one of his services. But, but the, the, the nephew left the organization because he realized by their actions that our organization and what Benny does and what the people who work for him do, they're denying, they're denying Christ. Um, so B, B, how to recognize them. How to, so that's who they are. They're not believers, and they're in the church. That's who they are. Now, how to recognize them. Uh, so here's what they're like. And I left you a little extra line here because I didn't want you to have, like, 20 blanks. 
but you can write whatever in there that you want to. I gave you a little extra space if you want to. Um, how to recognize them, how to recognize them, B. Here's what they're like. So that's number one, B1. I think I am B2. Yeah. Uh, how to recognize them. Here's what they're like. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10. They're deceptive. Ch these will be chapter 1 until further notice. Um, uh, verse 11, dishonest. So you can recognize them by dishonesty. You can recognize them by verse 15, being corrupted and impure. Verse 16, you can recognize them because they're unfit for doing anything good. That's what they're like. They're unfit for doing anything good. Chapter 3, verse 2, they are not peaceable. They are not considerate. They are not humble. So not peaceable. They're creating trouble. Wherever they go, there's, there's discord. They're not peaceable. They're not looking to get along with their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not, they're not thinking about other people. They're thinking about themselves. Consideration is considering others as more important than yourself, like Paul says in Philippians 2.4. And they're not humble. They're about building up their resume and building up their esteem in the eyes of others. It's a pride, a pride thing. And then verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3, they have malice toward others. They hate people. Still verse 3. And they have people who hate them. And if, if you got into it, you'd see there's just cause for people hating them. Okay, this, Paul's not talking about people been loving and kind and considerate to other people and uh, like to their coworkers. And they've said, hey, hey, have you ever thought about Jesus? And the coworker hates him because he's got something up with Christianity, something from his background, or, or he's got something in his lifestyle he doesn't want to get interrupted, so they, so they hate. It's not that that Paul's talking about. Paul's saying they hate others, and others hate them. That's just kind of part of who they are. Wherever they go, people end up hating them. And, and maybe that's instigated by they're hating those people. And they're hating those people, and those people don't give them the prominence they want or for whatever reason. Okay, so that's what they're like, deceptive, dishonest, corrupted, impure, unfit for doing anything good, not peaceful, not considerate, not humble, have malice toward others, hate people, and other people hate them. That's what they're like. And then number two, here's what they do. Here's what they do. Chapter 1, verse 2, um, Paul brings out this characteristic. Here's one thing Paul does. When there's a problem in the Every time he writes a letter, there's a problem in the church. That's why he's writing the letter. Churches that don't get letters didn't have problems. Okay? Paul's addressing problems, and that's a good thing to recognize as you interpret any book of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. It's God, by his Holy Spirit, addressing a congregation with problems that they're having through an apostle or through, an, through a prophet. And one thing Paul does at the front of his letters, when a church is having uh, um, like an Ephesus, they're having problems between Jews and Gentiles, and you see that in chapter 2 especially, and they're dividing between each other, and the Jews are saying, we're all that, and we're part of the kingdom of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And so what's, what's Paul say at the beginning of Ephesians? You were all elected before the beginning of time, so that makes you equal. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you Jews didn't come to it beforehand. Because before God created anything, he selected these Gentiles who were there in Ephesus with you as believers in Jesus. So sit down and shut up and get along. Okay, and so Paul brings up that characteristic of God that he is the elector of all people who come to faith. Right? Ephesians 1 4. And look at look at verse 1, chapter 1, verse 2. What's he say is true about God here to this group of people who have cultural acceptance of lying? He says, and God, who does not lie. So, Cretans, it's not okay to be like everybody else who's around you that you grew up with and all your friends who haven't come to Christ and all your friends who have come to Christ but are, you know, three months old in their faith. Um, God's not a liar. So that's something in your culture you need to be different from. Um, but this was part of the... The, uh, um, these wolves here. 
You know, they were deceiving people. They were, they were lying. But, but you see this, too, in, in verse 12. Um, you know, that they're, they're liars. Um, verse 9, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. In addition to being uh, people who do lies, they also hold unsound doctrine. Okay, and so, so uh, Paul makes sure that elders in the church are people who hold sound doctrine because the wolves were not holding sound doctrine. Verses 10 and 11, uh, they were teaching. So not only do they hold unsound doctrine, uh, teaching that's not true about Jesus, but they're teaching it. They're broadcasting it. They're not holding their errors to themselves. They're broadcasting their errors among the church. They're teaching things um, as they deceive, verse 10. So they're teaching, they're deceiving um, with this unsound doctrine that they had. And they were, verse 11, they were ruining entire families and households. Wolves do that. As Paul said in Acts 20, wolves will rise up and take disciples with them and ruin whole households. If you've ever been involved in a church split, you know that a lot of times those who go off in a church split, you know, you catch up with them two months later and they're not in church anyway. They're just, they're just out there and they're recovering. And, and maybe the dad made the decision or maybe the mom made the decision, the dad followed along and now their whole family's suffering. Their whole am family's not in church on Sunday morning and they're forfeiting the spiritual growth they could have for them and their families every Sunday morning. They're forfeiting the fellowship that would encourage them and bolster them in the church. And that's what these wolves were doing. They were ruining whole households as they taught things they ought not to teach, as Paul says there in, in verses 10, verses 10 and 11. Um, additionally, verse 14, chapter 114, look there. They reject the truths of Scripture. So here's a litmus test for a wolf. You present to him or her something clear in the Scriptures, and they say, well, I've always been taught, and they give you something else. And you say, like you have heard me say often, I don't care what you were always taught unless the Bible backs it up. I don't care what I've always been taught, and you folks should rejoice for that because I've been taught a lot of bad things from the time I was a kid and early in my Christian life and that kind of thing. And part of reading scripture each day is getting cleansed of bad things I've been taught in the past, things that weren't biblically accurate. But wolves, they actively, they reject the truth. They reject scripture. And when you present them with, with, you know, Jesus was glad when sinners came in to the worship service and their kids didn't know how to behave. And they had a, a boy, a high school boy, who was listening to his iPod. That's ancient, right? <laughs> listening to his tunes on his phone. Um, and they're mad that that person has joined in. And we say, how does that match up with, how does that match up with Jesus? When a, when a sinful woman, probably a prostitute, barges in to the house when he's eating with Simon the Pharisee and creates a scene and, 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 and weeps at Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her, with her hair, or wipes his feet or, or of the tears with her hair. Uh, with the woman who comes in and pours out perfume on Jesus. And Judas says, hey, that could, that could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And, and, and we say, but, but how does scripture match up with this? Jesus rejoices. Um, and, and so when, when someone comes in among us and they don't believe the right things yet, or, or maybe they're an atheist, or maybe at some points in the service they go, Pfft, like that, you know what we do? We say, you know what, if Jesus were here, he'd be like, all right. They're hearing my truth. And my truth is powerful. And my spirit's at work. And that's just Satan within them, just maybe rearing his last gasp of disobedience and rebellion. Right? But, but wolves reject the truth. Uh, they're actively doing that. Um, verse 16 and, and Matthew 7, verses 17 and 18, they reject God's commands. They deny him by their actions. 
Their actions are disobedience to his commands. So they're, they're, they're denying the truth by their actions. Uh, chapter 2, verse 15, and then into ver- chapter 3, verse 1. They despise church authorities. Okay, so the end of chapter 2, um, you know, they're, he, he says, Titus, let no one despise you. I know the wolves are doing that, and they will do that, but don't, don't put up with that. Don't let, them, don't let that affect you. That's, that's what wolves do. Because if you're a faithful church leader and you get in the way of a wolf, they will, you'll, you'll see some venom. All right? They'll despise you and they'll try to get other people to despise you as well. And, and then, so he tells the, then the, the believers there in, in 3.1, he says, you know, don't despise authority. Whether it's governmental authority or your authorities um, there, there in the church. So those who despise church authorities despise them, um, you know, are, 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 are wolves. They're in the church despising the authority. And it doesn't mean the authorities are always right. But when the authorities that God has ordained, ordained leaders, the elders in the church, are, are wrong, those who are controlled by the Spirit, those who are believers, approach with, you know, you see it in verse 2 and 3, with gentleness, with, with humility, with consideration. Uh, and and they, they come with this humility of, you know what, you're an ordained elder. I'm probably wrong, but here, here's what's going on. Help me with this. And, and, and hopefully, you know, you get a biblical answer that explains such things. Um, verse chapter, here's what else they do. Chapter 3, verse 3. They envy and they hate. Uh, chapter 3, verse 9. They argue and quarrel and promote controversies. That's a big obvious one. Someone's promoting a controversy in the church. Somebody's always quarreling in the church. Somebody's arguing in the church. That's, you know, that, that's a sign that they're a wolf. We were talking as a, a session uh, that um, we're talking about uh, um, questions. And, and we're talking about, you know, some of the questions that we delight in in Sunday school and we're talking about how we delight in the fact that, you know, sometimes the, 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 the questions, uh, the, the Anselm, who was a, um, a guy in church history in the 1100s, he was, a, uh, he was an English guy, and he wrote about faith seeking understanding. And, and he was talking about how, how when you have faith, you're in, and you just want to know more, and you just want to believe it correctly. And so the, the questions you folks have from Sunday school, and I was talking about my, uh, my son-in-law, Alex, and, and, you know, the questions he would bring to me about the Bible, it was faith seeking understanding. It wasn't, you know, R.C. Sproul talks about sometimes when you get questions, they're not really questions, they're accusations. And I thought that's always stuck with me. I remember where I was on Maitland Boulevard and Maitland Avenue, right? I just turned right. And I heard that on a tape or on the radio or something. And, you know, sometimes questions or accusations. Well, you're not saying that this is true, are you? That's an accusation. It's an accusation that you're an idiot and that you're wrong. It's just formed in the shape of a question, like Alex Trebek would tell us to do. All right? But here's faith-seeking understanding. Hey, you know what? I'm new to this. And, and I know that it's true that this, but I'm having trouble. How do we deal with this verse? You know, like we read about election this morning. So you look at John 3, 16, it says, well, God so loved the world. So how, how do we fit that in with the fact that Scripture also says that there's election that goes on? That's faith-seeking understanding. That's, and then an answer is given that's biblical, and there's appreciation for the biblical answer. And you hear that response, which we hear in Sunday school every week, Ah, that makes sense. Thank you. Because we have faith and we're seeking understanding. When we're given understanding from Scripture, we're grateful. Because we're in. We're not challenging the faith. We're wanting to understand the faith better. But when you're dealing with wolves, it's not that. It's questions that are accusations or just flat-out accusations, flat-out arguing. Uh, And that's what Titus was experiencing uh, in Crete there with these, with these wolves, promotion of controversy. Um, 
probably a dividing and conquering kind of thing by the wolves. Now see, um, here's why they do it. God goes beyond, as he inspires the Apostle Paul, God goes beyond um, saying here's who they are, here's what they're like, here's what they do. Paul defines why they're doing it. And so why do they do it? Uh, Chapter uh, 1, verse 11, for dishonest gain. Paul says, this is not innocent. They're not mistaken. They're not, they're not honestly mistaken. They're not honestly acting. They're not honestly speaking. They're not trying to do good for you. This is dishonest. They are being dishonest for their own gain. Um, for, uh, in your outline there, for themselves. The gain is not for you, Paul says. It's dishonest gain. They're being dishonest so they can gain. Okay? They're about themselves. They're not elders, and we see it through all, all of Scripture. It keeps getting impressed and impressed. And 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, Paul's dealing with st- stuff, too. I've been reading recently. And, and it's Christian leaders, elders in the church are there for the people. And they're there to lay their lives down for the sheep, like the chief shepherd Jesus did for us. And so Moses isn't asking for leadership. He's 40 years in the wilderness, and he's doing just fine. I mean, 40 years in Midian, in that wilderness. He got, you know, he got, got a wife, uh, got a new office, and the family is fine, right, Billy Joel fans. And so he's, he's married, he's got two kids, no one's bothering him. No threat from Pharaoh anymore. And he's there shepherding sheep for 40 years. And then God says, I need you to go back to Egypt where they were, look, they were hunting you down to kill you for killing an Egyptian. And I need you to deliver my people. And so Moses' plea is God's people rebel against him after those 10 plagues and he leads them out of Egypt is, God, I didn't ask for this. But you put me here. And this is, it's a burden that seems too big for me to bear, um, but I'll do whatever you want. Uh, but but that's, that's what the way church leaders are. They're honestly there for you and for your gain. And that's the picture of Jesus, right? That's the gospel. He comes and he honestly declares who he is. I am the son of God. And he honestly receives worship because he is God. There's no deception in that. And when someone bows at his feet and worships him, he says, be like her, Martha. Be like Mary. Sit at my feet and learn. She's chosen the good part. And and, and so uh, Jesus, he comes honestly and he comes for our gain. That we might have our sins put away. That we might have our sins punished not on ourselves. That's the gospel. Jesus, our chief leader, our chief elder, our chief shepherd, comes to honestly work for us, to lay his life down for us. And so that's what, you know, if, if a, a wolf's just the opposite of that. They're lying, they're maneuvering, they're creating controversies for dishonest, dishonest gain. Um, so that's their... That's their motivation. Whatever gain is important to them uh, for themselves, whether it's to dominate others, uh, whether it's for their self-esteem, whether it's because they want to be the leader, they want to have attention, whether it's what they want to be considered smart, maybe they want to be considered the authority theologically or biblically or just socially in, in the church. Um, it's, it's, it's about them. Um, Maybe it's just to be popular. Maybe it's to control. Maybe it's a controlling person, a person that didn't have control early in their lives. Maybe they were abused. And so they're seeking to have control and some security in their life by controlling people in the church. And they can't legitimately get that because they're not believers and they'll not get elected to office, hopefully. Um, But because they want to, so they're they're seeking to control through illegitimate means. Um, or maybe it's just the high of being in power. 
you know, it's different, different gains that people, that wolves might, might seek after. Okay, and then D. Here's what God thinks of them. So God, God goes further. He tells us, okay, not only here's who they are, here's what they're like, here's what they do, here's their motives, dishonesty, and gain for themselves at your expense. But then he goes on and says, here's what I think of them. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 11, and chapter 1, verse 16. They are warped and detestable. This is, this is God's word. This is what God says about those who come in his church and mess it up on purpose. Now, if you mess up the church because you've fallen into sin, but you weren't out to scramble the church, you know, it's just nothing but mercy and compassion and love for you. Really, that's the way Jesus is with us. But, but, but if, you're, if you're there to mess things up, if you're there to create chaos, if you're there to damage his bride, if you're there to damage the people for whom he died, here's what he says of you. And I'm not speaking to any of you that I know of. Okay? He says, such a person is detestable. Such a person is warped. They're bent. They're not straight. Um, warped things can't get straight again. Um, and he says they're detestable. Why? They're destroying what is precious to him, the thing and the people that, that he died for, that he came to serve, that he is empowering to, to have blessing and joy in their lives. And so with that D there, um, don't be nicer than God. Okay? Don't, don't say, well, God says they're detestable and warped, but uh, they're, they're okay. They're just a little misguided. No! You are disagreeing with God and in rebellion against his word if you call a wolf just a little misguided. Okay? I, I, I really want this to sink in. Now we'll talk, we'll talk, sorry Betsy. Now we'll talk here a little bit about how we interpersonally react to them. But in your mind, you're to have God's opinion of them. And God tells you, here's my opinion of those who come in to, to, to do trouble and to create trouble among my people. They're detestable. False sons. So don't be nicer than God. Have this evaluation of wolves as well. Agree with God and what you think about wolves in the church. Okay, this is about wolves in the church. Notice this is how Jesus treats the Pharisees. But when Jesus is dealing with greatly sinful people who are outside the church, who aren't pretending, who aren't creating trouble for him, who aren't the people in the crowd screaming for his crucifixion, there's mercy and compassion. But to those who are inside his people, telling people not to follow the chosen son of David, the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, him, it's him he gets mad at. I remember uh, one of my New Testament professors talking about John uh, 5 through 8. And Jesus is there in the temple, and he's going at it with the Pharisees. And he said, we read this the wrong way. We read this as gentle, nice, kind Jesus. This is furious. What Jesus is saying in front of all the people who are there, everyone listening in, and they're, you know they're gathering, right, when a fight happens. What happens when a fight happens in school? Everyone gathers to see what's going on. And this built and built and built. And Jesus says, you brood of vipers. Your father is the devil. That's what Jesus says to the Pharisees, right? Smack in the middle of John, smack in the middle of the temple. He doesn't say that to the sinful prostitute women who come to him. He doesn't say that to the Greeks that, that Philip brings to him in John 2. He doesn't say that to the Roman centurion or the, the, the servants of Roman centurions who come to him. But he says it to those who are in the church, wolves, who are leading people away from him. So it's no joking matter. Um, it's no joking matter to, to come into the church and create chaos, to be to be a wolf, um, so to speak. Um, I've got a diagram for you, and we're going to uh, just end uh, on this.
Okay, so here we go. Here's the world out here. Um, and Carl, can you get those lights for us? It's the, it's the switch that's nearest to the inside door, furthest from the away door. We'll see how good Carl is. At He's good at following instructions. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> so here's the world out here. And you know where we're going, everybody. Where are we going? Big box, big box. Yeah, big box, little box. So, so here's Israel as a church. Um, of course, this is not to scale. The, the world is much bigger. The world of people is much bigger. You know, lots of people. The church is just, you know, a little bit of it. But, but here's everybody who would be in the church or in the Old Testament times in Israel, uh, considered to be in covenant with God. And then here's this thing, saved believers. And there's a box right here, but you can't see that well. Inside Israel or inside the church, those who are in covenant with God, um, there's this group of people who are saved. Uh, and so you have people who have true saving faith. Um, but then out here, you got, you know, like someone who was born like four days ago. They don't have saving faith, but they're in the church. And kids are three years old. They're in the church, but they're not saved yet. Through saving faith, they come into this little box of being saved believers. In Old Testament Israel, you know, you got David here. You got Moses. You got Jonathan. But out here, you know, you got Absalom. You know, you got Korah rebelling against Moses. They're in the covenant community, but but they're they're not they're not saved. Uh, and so that's what we got here: the unsaved in Israel or the church. Who, uh, and you got some who are not causing problems. To all those people, we say, "Hey, it's great you're here. Come and keep coming and keep coming because we're hopeful that God's Spirit will work." By, through his word to bring that person from here uh, in, into here. Um, but then uh, you also have the unsaved in Israel, uh, like Korah, who rebels against Moses, or like Absalom, and, uh, who rebels against David, or, or Ishbosheth, who rebels against David, or, Jer or Jer uh, Jeroboam. The unsaved in Israel, oh, I've got a pointer in here. There we go. Um, the unsaved in Israel, the church, who are causing problems in it. And these are called wolves. Uh, the Pharisees are an example of that. Absalom, Diotrephes from uh, uh, third, third John uh, there. He was causing trouble in Ephesus uh, uh, about uh, 25 years later. Um, so that, those are our categories there. And we're just to be aware of these in the church. And various churches will have various degrees of you know, proportions in these boxes. You know, in a good, in a good church, you'll have this saved believers box will be very big. Uh, but it won't exclude unbelievers in the church because there will be kids, there will be people who are wondering more about Jesus and coming in to hear about the gospel. And we want those people, we want those people in the church. Like here are the ones that Paul's talking about with Titus. And those, those are the ones that God, uh, that Paul feared would come to Ephesus as he talked to the Ephesian elders in, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 20. And God said, this group of people <laughs> uh, de warped, warped and detestable. Um, they'd be better off just heading out and not causing trouble. Because God doesn't take very lightly people who cause trouble to his church, especially from within, because that's confusing and deceptive. Um, next week we'll, we'll pick up um, with our, our, our number two here. Um, so what we've seen here is our donuts. Yeah, our donuts are wolves in the church, and um, and I, I don't think we have anyone in our church uh, right now who's a wolf, and that's great news. Um, there's nobody who's dividing things or teaching things they ought not to see, you know, those kind of things, and, and that's a, a great place to be. And, and so um, anyway, um, let's see if there's any, uh, yeah, th in your summary. In your summary, go down there. There's a little bit that we can fill out here to, to sum up our, our uh, talking. Um, so our summary. Enemies, that's your blank. Enemies to your goal of godliness can be in any church. Um, churches can be small ponds. And someone who couldn't get prominence at work or even prominence in their family. Maybe they were a younger kid um, in, in their family. Um, or maybe they got picked on in school growing up. 
and, and they, you know, they have a motivation to cut, find a small pond where th people will have a higher esteem of them than they had growing up. Uh, but uh, enemies to your goal of godliness can be in any church. And so your goal of being more and more conformed to the image of Christ is being threatened whenever a wolf comes into the church because a wolf teaches things they ought not to teach. And we see right there from the get-go in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that knowledge of Christ leads to godliness. And so we want pure knowledge in the church coming from the scriptures, not things that, not, that ought not to be teached, not unsound doctrine. And that's why wolves uh, are part of why they present such a threat uh, to us in the church. Because in getting to godliness, we need accurate teaching. And wolves are, are ones with unsound teaching, and they're, and they're spreading it. We'll close there for now. Let's, let's pray.